Oh, she fell out and get her husband. <laughs> Oh, I wouldn't have a roof over my head if it wasn't for you, George. Quiet. Just a minute. Just a minute. Quiet, everybody. Quiet. Quiet. Now, get this. It's from London. Oh. Mr. Gower cabled you need cash. Stop. My office instructed to advance you up to $25,000. Stop. Oh. Hee-haw and Merry Christmas, Sam Wainwright. Oh. Telegram. Good idea, Ernie. A toast <laughs> to my big brother George, the richest man in town. <laughs> Christmas present from a very dear friend of mine. Look, Daddy, teacher says every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. That's right. That's right. Had a boy, Clarence. Proverbs 11.25 says that the one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are also helped. Every year about this time, I get into my holiday movies. I like to watch around Thanksgiving and Christmas a couple of movies that, that inspire me, that that fill my soul. And this is one of my all-time favorites. It's a Wonderful Life. It's with uh, Jimmy Stewart and Donna Reed. How many of you have seen that movie? God, man. If you have not seen this movie, It's a Wonderful Life, write it down and watch it. This, this really is a tremendous movie. They just don't make movies much anymore that inspire the heart, that, that, that speak to the soul, cause you to stop and ponder life and death, the eternal, the temporal. But in this movie, as most of us here know, there's a message of redemption. There's a message of giving, of thanksgiving. And I want to share this with you today. I just, I want to share my heart with you today because I love you and I think God has a message in this for us today. Father God, I just ask in Jesus' name, Father, that you speak this morning, Father God, that, Lord, your word go forth and accomplish your will, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanksgiving is coming. Amen. Here we got George. He's, uh, he's at a personal low 
in his life. We know the disaster that came upon him. He was, he's been set up, he's been lied to, he's been lied about, and he's ready to call it done. I don't know how many of us in here this morning have been there. You're just, you're, you're at the end. You've had enough that you can't take anymore. I'm done. And that's where George was, completely destroyed, thinking I'm out of here. And, and then we've got the angel, Clarence, who's awesome. And Clarence is happy, man. Clarence is happy just to be an arm of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Have we felt that? Have you felt joy just being the arm of the Lord in someone's life, just being able to, to benefit them in some way, and, and you're just so happy about it? You know, the, the, this came up, I was able to provide, I was able to do, and I'm excited about it. I was able to give something from, from, from myself, and, and that's Clarence. He's just so totally grateful to God that he gets a chance to serve. I think sometimes we miss that part in our lives, that part of servitude that that we should be so blessed and so happy about. We should be just just waiting for an opportunity like Clarence was. I like his part because he's cool. (laughs) He he wants to do whatever he can possibly do to help George survive this ordeal he wants to do, and he's got an idea, and he, he believes, I know how to do this. I know how to do this. Amen? You know, often we say that the greatest cure for depression is what? To give yourself to somebody else. Amen? Get out of your own self and go do something. Get out of yourself and go serve somebody. It's the easiest and quickest way to rise above uh, any depression. Go serve someone, help someone, do something wonderful. And it seems to begin this time of year that so many people struggle with depression of all kinds, anxieties of all kinds. It's like, it's like they're saved up all year long. And come Thanksgiving and Christmas, it gets, it gets dumped on society. And we see people everywhere struggling. Call it the, the holiday blues, amen? There's folks who see commercial after commercial showing them what they can't afford. Time and again, they show commercials of, of fathers and mothers and children sitting around a table with aunts and uncles and, and joy in the air and shouting and laughing and a, and a, and a bountiful feast laid out on a table that's just piled high with, with, with turkey and ham and, and stuffing and, and gravy and potatoes and pumpkin pies and apple pies, and you guys, I'll see you later. <laughs> and they say that, and, and, and so there are so many people who have to say to themselves, I don't have that. I don't, I don't have that. And we're so easily discouraged and depressed at this time of year. And then there's, there's, there's the weather, and, and it's just tiresome. You can feel so all alone, and there's folks who get to thinking, I've, I've got nothing to give, and I don't, I, don't, I don't have anything to give, and if I had it to give, i got nobody to give it to. Maybe living in a hotel room somewhere. And not the Hilton. Just a $40 room they found someplace. And it's 10 by 10 with a bed and one lamp with a string hanging from it that you can turn on. You you know what I'm saying? It's just a killer. But if we can find within ourselves, if we can find within ourselves, I'm talking, I believe, to the people of God this morning, if we can find in ourselves the gift that God gave us and give that gift. You don't have to go to Kohl's. You don't have to go to Target. You don't have to go to Toys R Us. God has put a gift in you. 
And it's up to you and I to make that gift available for someone else. It's in us. God put it there. We can find it in ourselves to give it away. If we can just tap into that and give it to someone else, how wonderful. What a wonderful difference it would make, and and not only in their lives, but ours as well. So we can taste the joy of thankfulness. We can taste the joy of giving because we also receive. That's how God designed it. That's how God made it to be. And He's asking us, His his people, enter into this. What a great opportunity. A nation called for a day of thanksgiving. Of course, God calls for it every day, amen? But what a reminder for us. A season that we can enter into. See, I think in order to be a thankful person, you've got to be a giving person. I think it works together. I really do. I mean, George was a mess. He was out like $8,000, if I remember what, how much it was. It was a huge amount. Then it was a house. Here's the key. Thankfulness. And thankfulness not for the gift, but thankfulness to the giver of the gift. If, if we give our gift to someone and they receive it in thanks, then they have returned a thankful heart to us. And what a gift it is to receive thanks that we can then turn and give to God. It's not ours to keep. We can get all puffed up over it, but the proper attitude is Thank you, Father, for the gift that you gave to me that I was able to give to someone else so that you might receive thanks. Woo! Good, huh? Yeah! George was a mess in his career. He was faltering, and yet the gift of giving was so far, so far inside of him, so deep within him that Clarence knew, Clarence knew, this guy is such a giver that if it became him or I, he would sacrifice himself to save me. So he jumped in the water and started floundering. And George, even in the depth of misery and preparing to kill himself, saw an opportunity to serve and jumped in. You know, God's waiting for some of us to jump in the water. waiting for us to get our heads out of ourselves, get our heads out of our own, our own stuff, and jump in and be a servant. Maybe we don't get our way this year at the family gathering. Oh. Maybe this year it's the other guy that gets a new car. It's not us. Boom. You know, maybe, maybe it's, just, it's just someone else that seems to get the blessings, but is that really true? Because it's not. The question is, will our gratefulness, our thankfulness, will will our gratefulness overtake those spirits of comparison and greed that are pressing themselves into the season that we're about to enter into? Will we overtake this season? Or will we allow this season to overtake us? It's a question that we need to answer, and it needs to be answered. And ain't no time like right now, because here comes the season. Well, am I going to be overtaken, or will I overtake? Am I going to be overcome, or am I going to be an overcomer? Questions to be asked. I want to express to us all today that as we focus on others, on their needs, on their sorrows, our lives are going to change. Our needs and our sorrows won't disappear, but there will be a perspective that takes place within us that my troubles, my needs 
will not be as great as I once thought them to be if I begin serving others. It's the old adage, you know, the, the man who had no shoes was, was angry because he had no shoes, depressed because he had no shoes until he met a man that what? Had, had no feet. Makes shoes pretty worthless in the comparison, doesn't it? You know what? I can go barefoot. So our perspective, our own perspective, our own needs, my perspective, my own troubles, my perspective of my own holiday blues begins to dim when I shed the light of Christ, when I shed the light of my gift on someone else. Why? Because it reflects from them. I get it back. You get it back. Not only do we get it back, we get to then turn it to God. We're little light reflectors. And we give it right back to God. You know, I think what what George's trouble was, was that he had lost perspective. I think he lost his thanksgiving and he yielded to this one crisis, and it was a crisis. But he yielded to the crisis. And this crisis began to shape his whole life. I think we've all been there where where we enter into a crisis and all of a sudden my whole life's a mess. Huh? Now, Now everything's wrong. Nothing's right. And we start thinking back. You know, this all started when I was eight years old. No, when I was six. No, I remember when I was born I was hungry, you know. And, and, and all of a sudden, everything I've done all my life is a big fat zero because of this crisis that I'm in the midst of. How foolish, how foolish we are if we think thoughts such as that. One crisis shapes my whole life, causes me to die. Isn't that perfectly what the enemy wants us to think? You know, your whole life's a shamble, you jerk. Things are really messed up now. They ain't never going to be right. You're never going to be well. You're never going to laugh again. You're never going to get things right at home. Your kids will never love you. I imagine your mom and dad are just sorry you were born altogether. Huh? Isn't that the way? I, don't, I get dog piled on like that all the time. I mean, it's like, devil, what are you up to, man? What are you unloading on me for? I'm okay. I mean, you, we've got to fight this stuff. This fight is coming. This fight is coming. It, it's coming to you soon. The holiday arguments. Everybody comes in the front door half, oh, thank, happy Thanksgiving, yeah, in about 20 minutes. Well, are we going to tap into that, or are we going to rise above it? Get ready now, because it's coming. It's only like four days away. You don't get to watch the holiday program you want, because two kids want to watch cartoons. You know, really, no ball game? What's up with that? I'm out of here. Amen. It's coming. It's coming. The beautiful thing about Thanksgiving, I think, is that Jesus showed us how to give. We only need look to Him. He's the one. I think the celebration of I think the celebration of Christmas is ideally placed. No, it's not the day Jesus was born. But I think it's ideally placed because it starts with Thanksgiving. And what a time to begin right now walking in the thankfulness and the gratefulness of what we are about to receive in the birth of our Lord and Savior. That should change our holiday. That should change our holy day that lies before us. We should become excited and be thankful and grateful as we watch the approach of the greatest gift of all, coming to us.
I love it. What a beautiful thing he's done. And what a great start it is as we begin with thanksgiving. Just think, Jesus was born poor, amen? Born poor. His mom's pregnancy was a scandal. He was hated and hunted by the government. The religious rulers scorned him, and yet he was the greatest giver and the greatest lover that ever walked the face of this planet. Golly! I can give thanks for that. I can be grateful for that. Even in the midst of all that, he showed us, even in the midst of all the miseries that came upon him, he showed us that we can still be givers, that we can still be thankful, that we can still walk in gratefulness before a mighty God. Tis the season. Jesus was a thanksgiver. Hebrews 4.15 tells us that we do not have a high priest that's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Amen? We have one who's been tempted in any way just as we are, and yet he did not sin. He was tempted to not be a giver. He was tempted to not be a lover. He was tempted to withhold so that his life, his own life, would be richer. And yet he taught us that it's not ours, it's Father's. It's not ours, it's God's. He taught us that. I looked up Thanksgiving, thankfulness, all that stuff. You know, I, I'm going to need my musicians. Um, I looked up thankfulness in the Bible. I, I found it like a hundred and... 104, 110 times. And, and that, I'm not impressed with, wow, I heard, found it 100 times. I was impressed with the fact that thanks, thankfulness, gratefulness, appreciation was a common thread from Genesis to Revelation. That it, that it ran throughout the Bible. I started looking at all the Scriptures, and they just start at one end, and they start at the other, giving thanks all the way through. First Chronicles 16, 8, give thanks unto the Lord, call upon His name, make known His deeds among the people. First Thessalonians 5, 18, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of Jesus Christ concerning you. Do you want to know the will of God? Give thanks. This is the will of God concerning all of you. Psalms 92, it's a good thing to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High God. Jesus was a giver. Amen? He took seven loaves, and what did he do? No, he gave thanks. Amen? He stood with his disciples. He took the bread. He broke it in. Amen? He took the, he took the wine. He poured it into a cup. And he took fishes, held them before God, and oh, there was a thanksgiver. If ever there was one. Giving thanks doesn't depend on, on quantity. Jesus gave thanks for a morsel of bread. It's not about quantity. What must it be? Quality? No, not even quality. It's simply giving thanks for a gift, no matter the size, no matter the quality, no matter the, no matter the quantity, it's a simple act of giving thanks. It doesn't depend on whether the glass is half full or, or half empty. Amen? It doesn't depend on that. It doesn't depend on that at all. See, thanksgiving, depend, what thanksgiving depends on is a God. A Father God who gave. A Heavenly Father who gave until it hurt. And if there's anything I think that prevents us from being gracious, bountiful givers is the fact that we don't like our giving to hurt. 
We can get quiet here. See, I can give when I got an extra 10. But can I give when it's my only 10? Jesus taught us to give till it hurt. And because of his giving, because of God's giving to us, we can be troubled, we can be destitute. We can be like Job was, sitting on a trash heap, scraping our sores with with shards of, of pottery. And having a friend, having a wife who, who came and said, you know, you ought to just curse God and die. This is not looking good for you. In Job chapter 2, Job answers his wife when she told him that. With boils and ulcers from head to toe, he told her, you are talking like an empty-headed fool. That's what he said. He said to her, Job chapter 2, verse 10, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, the Bible says, Job did not sin with his lips. The Message Bible says, You're talking like an empty-headed fool, woman. We take the good days from God. Why not also the bad days? He said, not once through all this did Job sin. He said nothing against God. He sat in thankfulness. If anybody could have despaired, would you not think Job was? If, any, if anyone would not be crushed in their, in their soul, in their mind, and in their heart, would it not be Job? And yet God gives him to us. It's kind, of, it's kind of like heaven's perfect, perfect response. It's heaven's perfect gift. It's God reminding us the opera ain't over until the big girl sings. It ain't over. You look pretty bad, but it ain't over. You look pretty well done, but I'm not. You look like someone who has nothing to give, and yet give what I've given you. Just like agape love, if we don't receive thanksgiving from God, how would we ever have true thankfulness to give? If we don't receive the agape love of God, do we have it to give? No, because we receive it from Him so that we might offer it. Thanksgiving is the same. So maybe, maybe this, maybe this, these couple of days before Thanksgiving, maybe, maybe we can find a quiet place, a quiet time to just, to just rest in our thankfulness for what God has done for us. I can't do it for you. I don't know. I don't know you that well. But maybe we can find in our own personal lives a time at which we can sit alone with God, shuttered away from the cares of the world, in a closet if need be, on a rock on the side of a mountain, And while receiving thanks from God, return it to Him. And realize the gifting, the bounty that He has put in every in every body in this building, the bounty that He has put in us, the gifting that He has put in each of us so that we might also give. It's not about the money.
It's not about the, the turkey and the ham and the taters and the gravy. It's about the love of God, the love of Jesus Christ. It's about gratefulness in our hearts. It's about thanksgiving. And like Clarence, an opportunity to serve in the things that God has called me to. God is a thank-filled God. Amen? Jesus is a thanks-filled Savior. Holy Spirit is a thanks-filled Spirit. God is full of thanks. He's full of giving. We, we, God's children, should be most of all thanksgivers. The thanks-filled people. Can we give thanks? Come on with me. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son. I could steal just a moment more of your time and 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 have you sit for for just a, another moment. I want to explain the the bag of corn that I handed out to you this morning. There were two guys that were out hunting along the river. When they came around a corner, they saw a bull moose, and he was looking at him. He had fire in his eyes. And just for a moment, all three were looking at one another, and and here he came. And so these two guys turned around, they ran. They ran, and they ran. And his partner said, pray something. And he said, what? He said, well, you're the Christian. He said, you talk about God all the time. You better pray now. Pray for us. He said, I don't know what to pray for. He said, God, he's going, to go, he's going to kill us. You better pray for something. And so the guy, as he's running, he said, oh, Lord, 
Oh, God, allow us to be so thankful, Almighty God, for what we're about to receive. (laughs) Sometimes when we're in the midst of the storms of life, we can't pray. Okay? It's hard for us. It's hard for us to give thankfulness to God. And yet Paul the Apostle admonishes us to be those thanksgivers when he says, give thanks in all circumstances. Amen? All circumstances. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Now Paul's the same guy in St. Corinthians that said, I worked hard, I've been beat up, I've been flogged, they beat me with 39 lashes, I was beaten with rods, I was stoned, I was lost in the seas, I've been in danger from rivers and bandits, in danger from countrymen and Gentiles. That's the same guy who just told me to be thankful in all circumstances. Amen. Amen. I, I, um, I've done something before that I thought would be a, a, great, a great testimony, maybe a great tradition. And, and I don't know if you might see it that way or you may not. We've got a lot of reasons to be thankful, amen? We've got a lot of reasons. But I thought of taking these five grains of corn and using Psalm 103 as a springboard of forgiveness. Do you have Psalm 103 up there? Ah, get it here. Or David writes, Bless the Lord, O my soul. He command, you know, it's interesting that he has to command his soul to bless God. It's as if he took him by the throat and said, soul, (laughs) you are going to bless God. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all of your diseases who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. The first kernel of corn that I put in that bag, I labeled the kernel of forgiveness. And I explain it in verse 3, that we have a Lord who forgives all of our iniquities, all of our sins, and a Lord who asks us to forgive others in the same way. So I think of forgiveness. The second kernel, I named the kernel of redemption that I found in verse 4, a Lord who redeemed my life from the pit. I have to remember where it was I came from and be thankful. The third, a kernel of healing. Again, verse 3, a Lord who what? Heals all my diseases. Surely on his time, but all. Fourthly, a kernel of love and compassion, because we have a God who crowns us with loving kindness and and, and imparts to us tender mercies. Every day of our lives, we wake up with mercies that are brand new. And the fifth kernel, a kernel of satisfaction and renewal. Because we have a God who satisfies our mouths with good things, who chooses to renew our youth like the eagles. You can put your own names on them, come up with your own explanations. But I think about sitting down for a a dinner this evening and taking the time to thank God for the blessings of our lives using five kernels of corn, five seeds. As maybe we go around the table 
and think about the things that we might be thankful for before we start to indulge ourselves in a bounty and it becomes all about food. So the bags of corn I've handed out to you, I'd, I'd like you to take and take home. And give thanks always. Amen. I close with one more song. My Jesus. My Jesus, my Savior, like you all of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty Forgiveness, Father God, allow us to be as your children. Grateful, Father, for the forgiveness that's been given us, the redemption that has come to us, the healing that is ours in the name of Jesus Christ, the love and the compassion that are given to us so that we might give to others, the satisfaction and the renewal of our lives, Lord God. Allow us to imitate, Lord God, in these these coming days, these days of, of thanksgiving, these days of gratefulness. Allow us to be givers, givers of thankfulness, givers of gratefulness. Father, show us, enlighten to us that gift that lies inside, Father, if it's a song, cause us to sing. If it's a a scripture, cause us to recite. If it's a prayer, cause us to to give that prayer in faith, Lord God. If it's a $5 bill, a $10 bill, Lord God, if it's a dinner, if 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 it's fixing somebody's flat tire and getting all greasy and grimy on the way to Volvo's house, Lord, whatever it takes, cause us, this church, Country Cowboy Church, Father, cause us in this season to be a people who give thanks, to be a people who walk in gratefulness, and to be givers such as as, as have not been seen before. Make it so in Jesus' name. And we will give you thanks, we will give you praise, and we will shout your name where we may go in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you one of all.